We've had Xi Jinping now come out and try to make some noises to say they're going to open up. We had Yi Gang, the new PBOC governor, overnight say we're going to open up our financial markets for investment and things like that. Where does that stand right now from what you understand? Nothing new, David. I mean, you know, there's a lot of spin going on in the markets to say, oh, you know, China has backed down and they have flinched. I look very carefully at what uh, President Xi and what Yi Gong uh, have said overnight from the Boao conference uh, in Hainan. Uh, and I was in China two weeks ago. There was nothing new at all relative to what was said then. Uh, the, the good news is, is that uh, in, in response to uh, obviously aggressive uh, moves by the U.S. China did not up the ante and come back uh, in kind, and I think that's encouraging that China wants uh, a negotiated end to this. But uh, the idea that uh, China came up with some new market opening news uh, does not um, uh, really uh, comport with at least what I know, having been on the ground there. So you're not encouraged. Let's sp talk specifically about what Egong said about the possibility of foreign investment insurance companies in greater investment in securities and things like that. Some things have been talked well, no, about. I'm encouraged, but, but again, this is something that um, uh, was stated very clearly several months ago uh, by President Xi and by his senior advisor uh, Liu He that there, China is going to move ahead aggressively in. Uh, lifting the ownership requirements on financial services. Uh, the, the news last night may have added a little bit more clarity to that commitment, but it was not new news. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed your piece that you wrote uh, for Bloomberg, I think it was last week, and you talked about how U.S. needs China a lot more than China uh, needs the U.S. in part because we buy stuff and we don't save as much. So if you come inside the Bloomberg, I wanted to, to highlight that point. Uh, if you wind up looking at the blue line, it's the U.S. trade balance versus the white line, which is the U.S. personal savings rate as a, a percentage of disposable income. They pretty much track each other. Can you walk us through? When a country doesn't save, and we don't, and I looked at personal saving, uh, business saving and government saving combined all adjusted for depreciation. The domestic savings rate on that basis was 1.3 percent of national income in the fourth quarter of last year. It's, that's, that's ridiculously low for a, a leading country. So we have to borrow savings from abroad to grow and we run these big current account and multilateral trade deficits. By the way, with 102 countries uh, last year, China's the biggest but supply chain impacts distort the magnitude of um, uh, China's share as well. So we don't like trade deficits. How about saving? And budget deficits of the Trump administration are taking the savings rate the wrong way, the other way. Our trade deficits are going to get bigger. So that's the point I tried to make. To turn protectionist at a time when our trade deficits are getting bigger is absolutely ludicrous. Well, this seems to be a, cri a critical point. Is it arithmetically possible to both run up bigger budget deficits and reduce your trade deficit at the same time? Because clearly we're running up bigger budget de deficits. You know, anything is arithmetically possible if consumers decide they want to um, uh, increase their personal saving to compensate for the massive uh, government budget deficits, then that might be possible. But the odds of that are close to zero. So what's the solution? The solution is for the U.S. to rebuild its own saving. How do you do that? Uh, go the other way on fiscal policy. We also need to uh, do a much better job at um, establishing uh, a mode of communication with uh, the Chinese, this idea that we have once a year summits, uh, you know, we come together with a grand party, doesn't cut it, it hasn't worked for 10 years. Uh, we need to focus on uh, market access, both in China, and the Chinese want to focus on access to our markets. A bilateral investment treaty is long overdue. And uh, thirdly, we need to deal with this issue of uh, uh, intellectual property rights and technology transfer. The key allegation that the uh, U.S. trade rep has made uh, toward China, and one that I would say is a case that has been very poorly made by their 180-page, uh, two-page uh, report uh, issued in late March. Is there a much better case to be made? Because there is a perception that, in fact, China is building for their future in technology by essentially taking Western intellectual property. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's the, the U.S.-centric view. that They claim that China has this horrible program called Made in China 2020-25 that's going to establish uh, their, their uh, uh, supremacy uh, in a number of leading ed edge industries. We do industrial policy, too. So did Japan. So does Germany today. We like to think that China is the only one doing this. That is ridiculous. We do it through the Defense Department. The military-industrial complex, uh, as identified by President Eisenhower, 
uh, in his farewell address in 1961, has been leading the edge in all of these uh, um, uh, uh, government-sponsored innovation R&D programs that have had enormous spin-offs from you know, NASA to GPS to um, uh, the internet and, and, and the like. And the idea that you know, China alone uh, has the right to uh, 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 focus its government uh, on innovation and R&D, and, and we don't do that because we're a market-based economy, that's flat-out wrong.